today. All right. All right. I think we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live stream. I hope everyone has had a great week. I have not had a great day today. I was downstairs on my computer just doing some normal stuff when it decided to stop rebooting and thought, I thought, what the hell? So I know a little bit about going into the BIOS and checking settings and so forth. But anyway, long story short, I try to take it over to Micro Center because I gave up after about seven hours trying to get this thing to boot up. It was basically giving me the, can I recognize uh, your hardware, uh, your, your hard drive? So I checked the connections. Of course, everything was correct. And again, I have no clue what's going on. So we are working today on my wife's computer, which is the one that I handed down to her when I order the custom built unit that I use for all my editing. But nevertheless, don't feel bad for me. Everything is going to be OK. We have Michael Lee waiting on the wings right now. And he was just telling me earlier several things that is going to be absolutely fascinating. At least they were fascinating to me something to do with the construction of certain types of cartridges. Things that probably no one even knows about because, heck, Canon and Epson are not going to pass out those secrets to us common users. Let me quickly say hello to everybody. Everybody who's on the chat, I hope that a lot of people are able to join us for, for a shot is here. And uh, he has a question. I'm going to leave the questions till later on tonight. Um, so just hang in there. I'm not going to be ignoring you, but I will take care of your questions if I am able to answer them. Chris Bell, PC technician boy, could I use you here today, my friend? You could fix this in probably 10 minutes. So again, we'll talk about that if you want to come on the live stream live afterwards, after we get done with Mike, I will be more than happy to have you come on board. If you have a camera and a microphone, you can uh, have a great discussion with me. I can tell you exactly what led to this whole thing. Sebastian Kloon is here. Jeff Thompson is here. And uh, let's see, Charles Verbruggen is here. Emmanuel Morat, Moreau, Moreau. Uh, Tango is here as well. And I, this is written in Russian text, so I cannot even begin to uh, try to pronounce that. But anyway, nice to have you here. And now, without further ado, as I say, we'll bring on Mike Lee from Precision Colors. Angelo Govico is here as well. I'm going to go ahead and I will post the uh, comments on the lower side of the uh, display here. Uh, Eric Crawford also is here. All right. So here is Mike Lee. Hello, Mike. How are you? Hello, everyone. How's, how's your week been? Better than mine, I hope. Well, I've had an interesting week. I've been busy. Good. First thing is uh, I've started to make some profiles for the Canon small desktop photo printers all in one. The one with the photo blue ink. Mm -hmm. So that'll be coming on my website pretty soon. And uh, it's pretty good. I've been testing this printer. And um, I discovered some interesting things. Number one, the two printers that fall in the same class that uses the 270, 271 tanks and the 250, 251 tanks, I think Canon has a small issue with their magenta. Mm. Their original magenta? Original, because I've been uh -oh. testing the original magenta and original OEM cartridges on this machine here. I think you can't see it. Oh, yeah, let me move it. 5020. Mm -hmm. And typically about a week of use, and I use it pretty much every day. There's always a clog or a non-firing in the magenta. And okay. I got to do a head clean. So this is not a color issue. No, not a color issue. Okay. So um, this happened on the 270, 271 series. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, it also happened on the 250, 251 series. 
And I've seen on DP Review some people saying that they've had issues with that, even with OEM tanks. So, so what family of Canon printers with those cartridges? Um, uh, they would go feed. on the MX nine two two. MX, okay. The the TS series, some of the IP eighty seven twenties, a whole range of of base desktops. And so, have, have you heard anyone of those folks that have those printers having issues like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. People always have a small issue of having to clean their heads often and wondering why. And I, I it ran into me as well. And I always wondered what was going on, what I was doing wrong. Mm -hmm. So I tested it with the OEM tanks. I bought a new OEM tank. I tested it with the setup tank. Happens as well, even with the aftermarket. The OEM seemed to be a little bit better, but it's not absent from problems. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think Canon had a little interesting issue there and it's not the first time that they've made a, a small boo-boo because mm -hmm. um, in that same series in the 250 251 there's an mg 6320 that they made a boo-boo in the firmware that they could not fix i think it's a hardware and that is when you tell it to print in high quality you got very coarse prints that was worse quality than standard so you're saying more like a grainy type? Oh, absolutely grainy. Yeah. You'd notice it right away. And you see that Canon said that they updated their firmware to try to fix it, and mm -hmm. they never really fixed it. So I think it was a hardware hiccup that they had that they missed. Mm -hmm. This printer today, the TS8220, the TS which has the photo blue, they drove me nuts. Why? It has a bug in the software. The bug is, is that it does not print sequentially. So if I typically, if I use this for printing labels, if I print a partial page I, and you want to restart on the next page, it can't mm -hmm. do that. It always restarts from the last final page. Wow. Yeah. Now on the MG series, prior to that, there was a software box you could tell it to invert the order. Mm -hmm. But that was an all cassette bottom feed printer. This one, the 8220, has a bottom feed and a rear feed. So in the rear feed that I used for printing labels, it drove me up the wall. I spent an hour trying to figure out what I was doing wrong until I said, OK, let me do a control test, check every single variable. And I think the firmware or the driver has an issue. So that's a functionality issue, not, mm -hmm. not a printing issue. Now, the other interesting thing about this Canon TS8220 that uses the 280, 281 tanks, that's when they, they left the gray on the 250, 251, and 270, 271, went to photo blue and they dropped the gray, mm. OK? Um, the print head sequence is different from the prior generations, even though it uses the same style tank. So I have a suspicion Canon recognized there was an issue with the previous print head in its design, and then made some revision. Because on this machine, that magenta issue does not exist. Mm -hmm. It's gone. But sure enough, other ones come up, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I've been having a nice, interesting time trying to figure out what's going on there. And during the week, we get the big announcement. We, you know, you asked me about that what two months or one month ago? Yes. yes. Replacements for the Pro 100 and Pro 3 and Pro 10. Mm -hmm. Now, we thought that there would be a dual announcement of the Pro 100 and the Pro 10 at the same time, because owners of both or oh, people in the know know they're pretty much the same printer. It's using the same common parts for most of their bodies, right? Yeah. Um, we got the Nelson for the Pro 300. At first, uh, after we spoke about what the replacement was, I thought about it some more. And um, 
I had told myself that they would reuse the same tank system they had on the Pro 10 for the pigment ink printer. And we'll go through that later as to why that is. The Pro 100, no announcements were made for it. But if you look in the Canon channel in the US, uh, there's none in stock. A lot of people are out of stock on that. So my suspicion is there's something in the wings. For the Pro 100. I have a feeling so because mm. here's the thing. Um, if you're making the Pro 100 and you've got to use the same tooling to make that, and mm -hmm. you've now got tooling to make the new Pro 300, you wouldn't want two lines to be running. You'd want one common line to be stamping out the same parts. Yeah. yeah. All right? Now, what's interesting is that the replacement for the Pro 10 from a branding perspective, they moved it up to the Image Pro Graph as a baby brother to the Pro 1000. And, and these names are significant because it's just like Canon bringing out a lens. They can bring out a standard EFS lens and they could bring out a red line, you know, the lens with their little red circles. Yeah. That's considered the professional uh, no holds barred uh, segment where you pay big bucks for it and you expect excellence. Um, they brought the Pro 10 up into that level or its replacement, the Image ProGraph 300, mm -hmm. right? So that, that was a surprise. I did not expect that because it brings some marketing issues up. And we, we can go up and discuss that later one day, but, but it's all hypothetical on my part. But what did Canon do to the Pro 10 that they did on the Pro 300? Well, first, I had speculated when I first saw the specs that perhaps they were using the same printhead as the Pro 10 because the nozzle count was identical. The Pro 10 has 7,680 nozzles. The Image ProGraph 300 was spec that 10 channels times 768, which equals 7,680. If you don't trust my math, bring out your smartphone. Okay, so I saw that. And I also thought about the reliability of the Pro 10. And I told myself, why mess with a good thing? That print head is pretty solid relative to what they've had before. I know I've had mine for, what, seven years, six years, seven years? And it's been solid from my customers. I know most of them. It's been solid. I've only heard of one person having to replace it because they didn't fill your tanks enough, and he ran out of ink. Yeah. yeah. So what can you do, right? So that, that'll kill a printhead. So, so I told myself, huh. I bet you they're using the same printhead. And sure enough, an astute forum member on printer knowledge then looked up the review that Keith Cooper had on Northlight Images. Yep. yep. And he, he looked, he peeked at the picture of the printhead that Keith had for the Pro 300. It had the identical part numbers as the Pro 10. Bingo. Yep. Same printhead. Did they, on the 9500, the old 9500, did they change that printhead? Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. The 9500 printhead was roughly based on the CLI 8 one. Yeah. Right? But, of course, it didn't fit. But the CLI 8 Pro 9500 days, Canon printheads admittedly were more flaky. Mm -hmm. We know that. Many people lost Pro 9000 printheads out of the blue for no reason. But lately, Canon printheads have been definitely much more rugged. Much, much more rugged. Okay, the other thing that I noticed that they brought out was self-calibration. We saw that with the Pro 1000. And remember, Joe, when we first saw the Pro 1000, it intrigued us. Would this machine create custom ICC profiles? That's what we thought. That's what we thought. But no, no, no. It's a densitometer. And when I found out that it was a densitometer, 
And during my development of the ink for the Pro 10, I found out why it was needed. Because inks will vary, print heads will vary, and paper will vary. So how do you get those three variances and always get a consistent print? You've got to marry all those three items up, and then you bring it back to a common level. And that's what the self-calibration is about. And that common level is the factory spec. And we'll go through that later on. Uh, the other thing I noticed was, thank God, they released the margin requirements. Everybody's bugbear about the Pro 10. And apparently QMH has a workaround, and you can discuss that with people. So I think that was like a whole hum at this point in time. All right? Um, other than been, that... Have you been able to figure out what the length, and does that apply to 13 I, width? I think it's 30 width something, width. 33 or 39 inches. Yeah, but it is, is it 13 by... No, I haven't done that part yet. Narrower side. I haven't done that part yet. But like 11. By the I'm way, not I'm privy. myself echoing on your side. Could you turn down your PC's volume a little bit? Okay. I hear myself. Let me do this. How about that? Hello, hello? Yeah. Hello? Is it all gone? Yeah. Yeah, I don't hear How about myself. That now? That's Is good. That, better? that was fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I. I don't have a Pro 300 in, with, on my, in my hands. I'm going to order one. I see the release date for the, the one that uh, I can get locally here is sometime in supposedly August the 3rd. So I am going to order one. And it's a big hurt because it's $1,249 Canadian. Yeah. And that's uh, a big price jump. I man. think the price point is sort of out of hand a bit when you consider, you know, what what are what is it that you're getting yeah. that will warrant that huge increase in price. Right. Well, and, don't forget you get the image prograph name, which is like the red line on the lens. Yeah, but that's that just means it smells nicer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, the red the red line. Yes, yeah, I know yeah. about it. So, um, I don't know exactly how it prints, but I'll go through that with you as well. Um, it supposedly prints faster. Mm -hmm. It supposedly reduces um, consumption of ink, so you use less ink, and that can happen as well. I can see how that's gonna could happen. It supposedly um, can detect when you got a clog. No, I'm not sure there's an actual clog detection, but again, we won't know I, until I get my yeah. hands on this printer how it's going to do it. Yeah, I was right. reading, uh, what was I reading? Um, our friend from England. Um, Keith. Yeah, Keith. Um, I think he did mention that, basically just saying that it just, but then other IPF models can do that as well, can they? The, well, don't forget... Replacement of a nozzle going bad with a redundant nozzle taking over. Well, or, remember this. It's using the same printhead as the Pro 10. So, um, okay. So, it, yeah, this, has, or, this had a lot of, lot of ramifications in terms of well, intrigue. Because does it mean that when they put out the Pro 10 printhead, that basically they kneecapped it? That it could do a lot more, but it was just kind of put out there, ready to be improved upon in the next generation? Mm -hmm. Or did they find a way to do this? For sure, there are no redundant nozzles. There's no talk of that. And I doubt there's redundant nozzles because but uh, 768... They, yeah, but the patient is there. They, that's, what I, that's what I got from that statement that... Well, detecting the redundant nozzles... goes bad, he gets re... Another one takes over. Right. I mean, but, another one from wire. Exactly. Exactly. Are, are they, did they did they somehow come up with a way to take a common Pro 10 printhead and kneecap it, as you say, so that it's only using, say, 
of its current nozzle number to actually print and then 20% of the nozzles are kept in reserve when needed. That would be the only way. No, it's no. Got the same? no, no, not necessarily, Joe. How would you bring other nozzles into play? Because it's strict. It if you have a yeah. very powerful processor, yeah. you can do it. Here's how you can do it. Two ways. You can use the densitometer to determine by printing a test pattern which nozzle is gone. Remember on Canon, we've always had the ability before to print a nozzle check that's at the service level manual mm -hmm. that goes nozzle by nozzle, just like an Epson. Mm -hmm. If you've got a sensitive enough densitometer or lens, you can pick up exactly which nozzle is gone. Now, how do you handle that gone nozzle? Well, remember the print that always interleaves when it's printing. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to do processing where it actually does a, it doesn't use a redundant nozzle, but it uses a positional redundant nozzle mm -hmm. and prints when it normally wouldn't be printing. Yeah. And it that would, comes out in nozzle control. Yeah. Right. That comes out in nozzle control because the biggest change from a Pro 9000 to the Pro 100 was the amount of nozzles Canon could actually control on a given pass. Significantly much more. And you could see that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Epson is the same effect. What was the difference between the 3880 and the P800? Nozzle control. And how many nozzles they could control in real time. And that's always been the bugbear about all the printers. You know, you hear people touting eight colors, so you've got eight times the power of eight, blah, 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 blah. You've got so many colors you can print. Not true. Because it, that assumes you have uh, an infinite amount of nozzles or the resolution you don't care one bit about. And you can go back a mile and see that, yeah, it's it's not a correct shade, but it's rough as hell because it's all mixed. Yeah. All right. So there's, there's a lot of people misinterpret that aspect. All right. So the, 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 no, the no surprise was the 10 channels. And some people were complaining that uh, they wish Canon would bring out a better chroma control because the driver looks fairly limited in what it can do. But, but to be honest, I think I touched upon this before. If you use or know how to use Canon's form control in the Chroma option, it becomes extremely powerful. Okay, but the key thing is you gotta learn how to use a form control. Because once you, once you learn that form control, you have an infinite control over your chroma, mm -hmm. not only where the chroma goes, but how much you want to put in there. So depending on paper, if you want to get a better gloss or you want to have a certain look, um, you can play with your chroma control in the form controls. And the form controls is actually a, a situation where you create a file and this file is actually loaded into the printer. It sits in the memory of the printer, mm -hmm. right? So something that uh, many, many users overlook because we just go file print and ICC and we figure that's the end of it. Not for these machines. So it, it looks as though Canon had a lot of technical features in the Pro 10 that many did not catch on to. And I'm left wondering, it was there and they just held back only so that they can release a new model and give us more features. I don't know. Only Canon would know, but mm -hmm. the new printer definitely has a new print engine. It says it uses a Lucia Pro ink set. The Lucia Pro ink set is the same as the one is a 1000. And for those who are refilling, um, not a problem. 
because in, essentially I already have the Lucia Pro ink set for the 1000. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I can relax the requirement for the OEM yellow on the Pro 300 because it does not have intermediate tanks. So by profiles, I can basically get into a, a color match right off the bat with no variations forward. That's opposed to mixing in the intermediate tanks in the Pro 1000, et cetera, as you know. And then you've explained right. to your, you know, your viewers. Yeah, I mean, refilling on the Pro 10 gives you an instant pretty much. Exactly. Motion. Yeah. Yeah. But Pro the red, I think, is going to still remain. The red, I think, the red requirement mm -hmm. is a foundational, uh, in, in, it's foundational in the print engine. So I think that's going to remain. And I'm not happy with the aftermarket red. So after I get the the Pro 300, oh, there's one thing we forgot to talk about. Chips. <laughs> That's the $64,000 question, right? Yeah. I think they're going to come out with some pretty darn tough chips. And I got to tell your viewers again, when the Pro 100 and Pro 10 came out, the Pro 100 especially, we thought the day for resetting was already done. Remember? Yep. And it was quite an aberration that they used basically a little bit of a variation from the CLI 8. And Red Setter was able to get around it. Yeah, wasn't it, um, if I remember way back, um, some of the colors could be reset, some of the chips, with a CLI-8 type resetter. No, no, that was the Pro 9500. 9500, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. But on the Pro 10 and Pro 100, um, you can reset common colors, mm -hmm. except that both printers do not have the same colors, and one has 10 and one has 8. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you do, you're always going to have to have a resetter for both because yeah. yeah you've got 10 for a pro 10 but guess what the pro 10 does not have a light gray so you're going to be missing resetting the light gray in a pro 100 if you try to use a pro 10 right and the resetter the, the pro 10 uh gray is actually a very dark gray isn't it well i think you're now starting to, to get confused the, with the pro yeah, one yeah it matches the dark gray of the pro right one. Right. Canon did a little switcheroo on, on users, and I know yeah. we got caught in that, and that's how we learned it the hard way. Do you think uh, the Pro 1 today still produces a smoother looking result as far as tonal gradations because of those basically more grays than, <laughs> than the Pro well, 1, that the Pro 10 or the Pro 1000 even? When I use the Pro 1 in black yeah, and white, great. I love it. It, it. it has the very, very smooth tonal gradation. Mm -hmm. The Pro 1, in my eyes, I could see a little bit of green. Mm. Right? Now, we should not always confuse the fact that a, a printer has more colors or more grays and gives you a smoother gradation. If you had the same print engine, that would be true. But if you had a different print engine, you could possibly do as well or better than one that had more inks. And again, this is where the newbie printer people on a lot of forums gets, you know, they get carried away. And, and manufacturers want us to believe that more inks equal more colors, and you'll be able to print more colors in your picture. And it's easy to sell. That's an easy story to pass to someone, and they'll swallow it very quickly. Right? So, But people who listen to your podcast and people who you've taught will tend to get a little more skeptical about that as time goes along. Mm-hmm. Because we want to get to the nitty gritty of what's actually happening, right? And and again, you're not gonna look up some. I don't think this information is anywhere on the internet. Tell you the truth, mm -hmm. 
I certainly didn't find it on the internet. I yeah. had to do all the work myself and dig into it myself to see what the heck was going on. Because, like, for example, on the 3880 and the P800, the P800 tends to use a more balanced set of inks. Balanced in the sense of you're not using all your light colors out before you use your, mm -hmm. your dark. It tends to remain more balanced. Now, there's a good thing for that. One is you use less ink. Mm -hmm. And that's possibly what the Pro 300 is going to do. It's possibly going to use a few more or a little bit more of the darker colors as opposed to using more of the photo magenta and photo cyan to generate the same shade, and that'll reduce ink usage. Does it always have to have a penalty with grain? Not necessarily. And this is where I think the print engine is new as well in the Pro 300. Mm -hmm. You know, if they, it, it has to be new because you're moving to a 10-channel Lucia Pro as opposed to the old Pro 10, even though it's using 10 inks, same colors, it's not actually the same color of ink. The color of ink between the Lucia Pro and the Pro 10 is different. I tested it myself. And that's the reason why my Pro 1000 ink set was released months after the Pro 10, because some changes had to be made for the Pro 1000. Yeah, people are constantly asking uh, whether this red or that red is compatible, you know, different Canon uh, reds from different large um, volume cartridges, <laughs> you know, and I always tell them no. Um, and I learned this from you during the uh, development period for the uh, Pro 1000 ink set. You were explaining that to me and I thought, hmm, that's strange. Why would Canon do that? Well, I guess they need to orchestrate everything so that it works together with the print engine Yes. Right? I mean, yes. slight differences in, in the um, chromatic qualities, I guess you could say, of red and... Uh, whatever so red, the technical red, terms reds, are. Reds are not all reds, and magentas are not all magentas. Yeah. 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 The, the new people to printing always think all cyans are the same. Yeah, um, and I, I've told people that, um, and they, this is something that's hard to, you know, accept and grasp. If you just went to Photoshop and created like just a, a set of patches and you create pure magenta, maximum saturation, pure magenta, yellow, cyan, and, and you know, RGB as well, and then you print them without color management, it's going to look really odd. In other words, by printing with a color managed workflow and an ICC profile or just letting the driver is going to composite to really create an accurate version of what you see as magenta, yellow, cyan, red, green, blue. I tried it and it was really odd. The, the, the magenta I was getting was not what the screen was showing me when I printed it raw without no color management. The way you print a profile chart. And yes, the magenta needed help to create a patch that actually look like magenta on my screen. Yeah. You look at magenta ink in a bottle, it doesn't look like what the screen is showing you. Yeah. Pink, pink yeah. words. Yeah. I, we covered that before yeah, in terms of the, the, the color that you see ink in a liquid format does not always match what you think you're going to see on paper, especially with dye ink. Yeah. So this is not dye ink. You remember that yellow ink that you had me try out for the R2000? Right, right. They look greedy. like look a little bit green. And yeah. I put the bottle and I thought, oh, my God, what is this crap? <laughs> <laughs> I loaded it and it printed beautifully. <laughs> yeah. Beautifully. So, yeah. So, so you know, uh, Canon also claimed it had better blacks. Was I to doubt them? No. Because we saw a few weeks ago or a couple months ago, I showed you that when you print with the standard OEM profile and you eliminate the black, you get paper. It didn't use any of the color. You were missing the black. Mm -hmm. But then when you create a custom profile and you print it without the black, you get photo blue. So that tells you 
how are you generating the big black? Well, the profile is doing it, compositing that black to match the exact paper you're using. And that was also Epson's trick as well in the K3s. Mm -hmm. That the black that uses black is being composited on the paper. And they've always done that on the monochrome. We know that. Yeah. That's how you generate a, a neutral tone because yeah. uh, the gray inks by itself, as gray itself, is not neutral. Yeah. All right. And so dye, dye black ink is very purple. <laughs> well, some you, dye, you, some yeah, dye black. It depends. You, I mean, even, yeah. you know, oh, I did OEM, OEM um, black as Pro 100 ink just dropped a few drops in a glass full of water and showed everybody and it was a beautiful purple you know yeah it's it's, it's, it's a composite with, black it's a composite black yeah basically it's a little blue and a little bit of yellow ink composite with that will give you a nice neutral tone yeah so it's my, so my conclusion in the pro 300 it's an evolutionary step it brings in the red line aspects of accuracy Mm -hmm. within the image pro graph series so that you can have, for example, uh, a pro 300 in, in, in your home and a friend has a pro 300 2000 miles away and he could reproduce the print you're making in your home 2000 miles away, 3000 miles away, identical. Assuming they both calibrate. Right. Yes. Right, and that was the aspect of the image prograph series mm -hmm. is they wanted consistent color accuracy from print to print, paper to paper, ink to ink, office mm -hmm. to office, location to location. Right now, on the high end Epsons, you can pull that off, but here we've got an entry level Pro 300 that they've given this feature to. Yeah, well, entry level, but when you look at the price, it doesn't oh, seem you know, entry level to the red line. You know, we, we don't have to call it image program. We call it a red line printer now. Yeah. And that's that's like, you know, you compare the same uh, zoom on a red line or prime on a land line, red line compared to the standard line, and there's a significant price difference. Yeah. So it it it, it makes you wonder in North America. Um, you know, the Pro 10, I saw in Murphy's. Click, click. Yeah, Murphy's camera. Yeah. Yeah. It's still going for $200. $499, less 200 rebate, less $100 off in-store discount. If you're thinking about getting an affordable pigment printer, folks, that don't can, pass this up. That can currently be refilled yeah with that's refillable yeah easy on your pocket i think if you if you wait too long they're gone they're gonna be gone yeah so it, it leaves me wondering how can an 899 printer be an entry level unless canon's got another one up the sleeves is there going to be a pro 10 mark ii <laughs> That sold uh, for six ninety nine. That would be odd. Yeah. Well, if you eliminate the densitometer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And you don't give people the ability to specify that small margin. Yeah. Then hope, you you yeah, know I you could force them. About, I saw something about um, no maybe it was referencing something else about barcoding. No, that was that was a no. Sorry. That's that's the um, twenty one hundred and the forty one hundreds. They they were talking about various um, large format compared as you know thrown in alongside the P the Pro three hundred talk. Um, one thing I was talk I was thinking about is with the Pro ten. I mean I use that printer for everything. I I do have a junk printer that I can use for my text, but you know what. My Pro 10 is right next door, and I use it for everything because I can fill it for, what, 70 cents a refill? 
So, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about it. Maybe a dollar. Every Pro 10 or Pro 100, Joe? Oh, the Pro 10, I use it for everything. The Pro, okay. 100, the Pro 100 for me is for photos. The Pro 10 can do everything for me. Yeah. I just work the hell out of it, you know. So far, so good. Nothing at all wrong with it. And don't forget on the Pro 10 for a refiller, zero modifications required. Mm -hmm. Zero. No flushing of tanks, no modification of tanks. All you got to have is a, a scale. And many people have a scale in their kitchen or for their hobbies. Yeah. And you're done. Tell us about, you were showing me earlier, um, some of the internal. Yeah, uh, well. The secret accessories. Well, one of the features. The two has. Secret accessories. Okay. Pro 100? No, the um, Pro 10. Pro 10. Okay. All right. I got you. I got you. Okay. Explain what some people may see occasionally. And I'll, I'll just explain it for you while you're getting pre prepared. Okay. Here, here it is. Um, yes. The Pro yeah. 10 uses the same ink tank as the Pro 9500. Right. Hold on a second. You guys may experience the Pro 10. Mike, hold, hold on. You guys may experience this. You guys don't use this printer for a month or two months, and then you turn it back on, and you hear it moving sideways, back and forth, back and forth, and you yeah, wonder, well, what, the hell, what the hell is it doing? It's yeah, well, you. we'll show them. We'll show them. So let's go back to the history. This cartridge here was developed for the Pro 9500, and it's identical profile as the CLI-8. And the CLI-8 was identical profile as the BCI-6 going back since, what, uh, 2000 or so? Mm. Well, my, maybe even before that. That's right about the time I started printing inkjet. Right. Yeah. So, so this shape has been retained since way back from this. And it was kept into the Pro 10. The difference, the Pro 10 has got a little bit of a, a clear, not clear, but a, a, a window here that's clear in color, but you can't see inside. Mm -hmm. The Pro 9500 actually had a window you can see inside of it. So what's inside of it? Uh, let me put it together here and show you. And, and folks, this is why you should never buy compatible cartridges for your well, we'll get to that why we'll get to that why so if you take the cover off let me put you on full full screen here there you go there you go if you take the cover off from this side of the pro 9500 tank you'll see you'll get a a metal plate here now to get to that metal plate i had to cut the bag the bladder that usually covers that. Okay. That bladder will work something like this tank here. Whereas you use the ink, the bladder goes in. The printhead basically sucks a bladder in. So once you've got this bladder, what's behind it? You got a spring. The spring always pushes the bladder back out. And that's how the Pro 10 and Pro 9500 and the Pro 300 will be refilled. The internal spring helps you or forces the ink back from the bottom into the tank. When you go into the tank, you got that spring. What's this? Listen carefully, folks. You hear that, Joe? Mm-hmm. When you got 10 of these in your printer, you... Hearing this thing rickety rickety rickety, what's going on? That's shaking the ink inside, and that's that's Canon's new new shaking system to mix the inks to make sure you got consistent quality, so that there is no sedimentation of the ink down there that'll give you a darker color. So as the printer is printing, and it's going back and forth, you're hearing this. I think there's a setting in the maintenance tab, right? Something to something called like ink ink quality, 
something yeah, like that. And right. it performs the agitation. Yeah, and all it does is just this. It just shakes it for you. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, what else? So, like I was saying, that will not be found on anything but OEM cartridges. Correct. Correct. And the, the spring is vital as well because it maintains the right amount of pressure to stop the ink from dripping out. But as well, it doesn't do it too much. Now, if you thought that why would Canon go to all of this if they could have just used a CLI-8 tank with a sponge and just drop the pigment ink in there? Reliability, folks. This ain't going to do it. Anybody who's tried pigment ink in these directly finds out very quickly it doesn't work. And some of the compatible cartridges have sponges in them. Yeah. That's the reason why we always recommend you don't throw these suckers away. They're much more valuable than you think. Mm -hmm. They're fundamental to the design of the Pro 9500, Pro 10, and now the Pro 300. And again, because of the development time Canon took to make these things and tune them, which is a, a, a delayed introduction of the 9500 for over a year, actually. Mm -hmm. um, when they announced a, a replacement, I kind of knew they were going to hold on to this because it's much more expensive to manufacture a printer with stationary tanks and ink lines mm -hmm. and all sorts of routines to make sure the ink lines does not get air in it. So these are much more reliable. But yeah, they're only 14 ml, 15 ml. Um, if you're buying OEM, yeah, that's a gripe for people who refill. Hey, it's a pleasure because when you refill them properly, they self-maintain. So they always act very well. They're very liable if you refill them properly. <coughs> okay. So that's going all the way back to the Pro 9500 days, which is over 10 years. <coughs> mm. Over 10 years, I knew joke. about this stuff. So for some of your viewers who think uh, we're new to the game and and refilling is not reliable, it'll muck up your print head, et cetera, et cetera. If you know what you're doing, it's a different story. Right. Well, with a Pro 10, you could probably match the um, reliability of ink flow if done correctly, because you're not altering anything physically. Yeah, you're not altering or, on a On a CLI, old CLI-8 or CLI-42, you have to literally, you know, get into the cartridge by removing that. Yeah. You're, you're actually tempering. Like, I look at all my OEM cartridges that I have not touched yet. They have the top of the sponge is white. When the factory apparently fills these cartridges, either by vacuum, I don't know what they, method they use, they, their ink never really saturates to the very tippy top of the sponge. That happens only when you sever that system and you remove that ball. From now on, every time you refill, that sponge kind of gets oversaturated, I think. Um, I've but shown, that's, yeah, I've that's shown not that. a bad thing, actually. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, when you're going to refill, you want as much. Yeah, because the, 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 the uppermost gets used up first. Mm -hmm. When you print, the ink doesn't come out of here first. It comes out of the top first. When it comes down to a certain level, mm -hmm. then it starts pulling ink out of that's, the... That's when you really part. see the um, the layers. Right. As well. That's when you see the layers. Okay, now I'm going to add something about this tank. The Pro 9500 tank, because about eight years ago, I think, Canon introduced the XP600 series. So while the Pro 9500 was popular, Epson introduced this tank first on the XP600. 
So immediately I saw that was very similar in construction to the Canon. And wouldn't it be a dream, especially on an Epson, that they would have matte black ink for the black text and five colors, photo black, cyan, magenta, yellow, for the photo printing, it would have been a pretty nice printer to have a general purpose printer. So I got an XP600 and um, I loved it. Except after a while, a few things started to occur. The refilling of these was identical to the Pro 9500 because it has an ink pad that all you had to do was put ink back on there and the cartridge would suck the ink back in just like we do in 9500. All right? So you're just dribbling ink in there. You just dribble ink in there and the, the, the cartridge would just suck it back in like the Pro 10 9500. Dream come true, OEM tanks. And you know, we couldn't refill OEM tanks easily. Mm -hmm. So how could this be so easy to refill? Except that when I started to take it apart, here's what I noticed. There's actually a very unique valve at the corner of the tank here. Okay. And what happened is, is that the reason the 9500 refills so easily is because when you use the ink up, no air gets in. And you've got the spring. Now, what happens to the 9500 and Pro 10 tanks if you have too much air that gets into the bag? It doesn't want to fill up, right? Mm -hmm. And we've got to extract that air out. Correct? Yep. All right. No, I use a little adapter. Yeah, collapse the you bag. Suck it out, and, and you you you're back to square yeah. one again, and yeah. you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Well, the Epson tanks here actually have a little valve here, so that when this diaphragm gets close to low, guess what it does? It opens a valve and lets air into the bag. Hmm. <laughs> Very, very clever engineering to prevent you from refilling it. Wow. Imagine that. They actually put in a valve so that when it gets low, it opens the valve up and allows air to go in. So what happens? The diaphragm goes back out when air goes in. Ink still comes out. Hmm. <laughs> but when you turn it over to refill it, there's no more suction because the diaphragm is back out. Yeah. It doesn't want to come back. It's filled with air. Hmm. So, again, Dude. Epson displays their, they're very clever. They've got good engineers, that, but they engineer it so that they prevent you from refilling. Hmm. Are there any current, current Epson cartridges that are, able to be modified for refilling. Well, um, I don't think so. I don't I'm, think so. Yeah, the big a, issue is the chip. Big yeah. issue is the chip because with an Epson, oh, by the way, people are wondering whether or not we can refill the Pro 300. And I will guarantee you that we will be able to refill it by overriding the chip. Now, why are we going to be able to override the chip? Because you notice on this tank, there's no optical prism anywhere. Mm -hmm. So Canon could never be sure that all the ink is actually consumed. So they've always got to give you a back door to use up all the ink should you complain. Because remember when Epson did that, they stopped you from using the tank and it was full of ink. They got yeah. sued up the wazoo with a class action lawsuit. Yes, they did. it. Right. So Canon will always allow you to bypass that chip so that you can use up whatever ink in there is in there. And you can't say, well, I couldn't use up all the ink I paid for. Except can't that be a bit dangerous? <laughs> yeah, it's dangerous. But hey, when you press that button, say you're taking that risk to you're bypass, you're taking the risk. Yeah, you're on your own.
you're on your own, all right? So, yeah, you got something, you got to get it another way. So with this new model, people should be able to, just like we were doing with the Pro 100 initially. Pro 10. The Pro 300, the Pro, Pro 10. Too. We were disabling yeah. you know, all the folks. Yeah, because there's, there's, ink, doing that. Yeah. there's ink in the, in the sponge still left. And you'll see, hey, Canon, there's still ink in there. I want to use it. Well, okay, you can. Just bypass it, but you're on your own. But people need to realize that just because a sponge looks like it's stained doesn't mean you have milliliters worth of ink to use up. All right. There's a point where you really need to stop printing. Right, right, yeah. right. So getting back to Pro 300 today, um how is it going to be able to tell that it's got a clog well if you print a, a pattern you can tell the the densitometer the lens there can tell whether or not a stripe is missing that's one way of doing it um another way of doing it and by the way that's that's how the pro 1000 does it when you do the nozzle check mm-hmm Right, because remember the Pro 1000 has all these stair step patterns. So we'll have to see whether or not the Pro 300 also uses a stair step pattern mm -hmm. in its nozzle check. And if it does, um, that's one way of doing it. Another way you can do it is if you had a temperature sensor on each and every single nozzle. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I, exactly. That's what I told myself. I don't know if that's actually possible, but it's theoretically doable that if you detected a temperature rise during printing, you could somehow surmise that, hey, maybe this nozzle is not firing. I shouldn't be using it. Hmm. Right? Or it's totally cold. It's not firing. It's burnt out. It's no good. Yeah. So if it's not within a certain range, I know something's not right. And then I will then shift my duty to another nozzle and let the printer assign my printing to another nozzle. Not necessarily a redundant nozzle, but a, a, an existing nozzle that isn't used while it's during the, the interleaving. Yeah. All right. So the fact that they say they can, they can do this, uh, minimize striping and banding using the same printhead, Many people thought immediately they've got redundant nozzles. Physical, you know, an extra spare set doesn't have to be that way. If you've got the engineering capability and the processing capability to pull it off. Right? Maybe that's where that $900 plus dollars comes in. Yeah, you, you don't know. At this point, until we get one in our hands and understand how it works, all we can do is guess, but if you read off the technicalities of it, um, it doesn't tell you how it's doing it. it kind of does, kind of will never tell you how it's doing it. You got to figure it out yourself. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, tanks, density, calibration, calibration. Again, on the image prograph series, every printer you get, as we talked about, you can get consistent prints. From office to office, location to location. And since the Canon line has replaceable print heads, people, should a print head go bad, they can repair their own printer by just getting the print head out, dropping a new print head in, pop the self calibration, and boom, back to factory spec. All right. Now, let me, let me post a, a comment somebody just made. Can you see that? Okay. Ah, he says the Pro 300 nozzle looks like the Pro 1000. Indeed, maybe that's what they're doing. The same way the Pro 1000 works it. So gone will be these uh, these. I mean, yeah, that's light bars. I don't have anything here with me. No, no, uh, everything's downstairs because of the problem today. But yeah, yeah the Pro 1000 nozzle check is pretty easy to read, unlike. Yeah just a band of color printed on regular plain paper and you got you got bleed and yeah um basically what it's doing on that band is there 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 are lines 
It's just that they sort of blend together. And I tell people, you need to print that nozzle check on some cheap glossy paper so you get minimal dot gain and you can actually take a loop and see if there's a little line missing. Otherwise, you just you just cannot tell. It just looks okay. It looks yeah. fine. Yeah. I, ha I had a, uh, a recent person show me on Facebook. They were having a drastic color change problem. Uh, the shadows were practically gone. They were, they looked like they were solarized. And the nozzle check is perfect. I said, yeah, let me see it. So he took a picture of it. Yeah, uh, on the Pro 100, all seven nozzles were, all, or, all, seven, all seven channels were perfect. Guess what was missing? The black. <laughs> but he had grace and, you know he, all he saw was perfect channels he didn't notice that one channel was completely missing well, the, the change and yeah uh, something like that on a pro 10 or a pro 1 or a pro 100 is easy to see that your channel is completely gone but if you're missing one nozzle it's hard because of the the way, unless you run a uh, uh, service mode type um, nozzle check, right? That's more a structure type nozzle check. Um, anyway, so, so what's Pro that? 300, my, my uh, summary? Yeah. yeah. If you own a Pro 10, I'm not sure it's worth it to upgrade. It, it probably will be an upgrade, but I'm not too sure many people are going to appreciate the difference because I, I, I can't see how there's going to be – I don't see it being significant, mm -hmm. right, especially if you're at the entry level of printing. Um, I don't think the folks at that level are going to be able to – quickly discern the difference between a yeah. Pro 10 output and a Pro 300 output. Yeah, the, the, the folks that are here are, you know, we've been around the block a couple of times. And yeah. so I, I, could see what you, I could see what you mean by, you know, like a, because some of the, the literature I've read, they use all this fancy terminology to try to bait you to think that, oh, Use some fancy terms. That means this this printer is really fabulous. But if I'm starting out, sure, why not get a Pro Pro 300? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm set up. I don't need anything else for quite a while. But if I already have a Pro 10, yeah. really, are you going to see the difference in two identical images printed on both printers, same paper, using the same color managed workflow? I don't think there's going to be a drastic difference. They're talking I don't think about so. the better black. How is that going to be manifested? What do they mean by that? Is it just deeper? Are my blacks going to be more inky? I, I don't know what they mean by that. That's what the P800 was claiming. Right. And did we see what a significant that? difference between the 388 and P800? Not really. Uh, was yeah. it worth the upgrade? No. And I think it would depend on the image. If the image is a demanding image. Maybe, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's going to be a huge difference. But 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 don't you know to your viewers? Don't interpret that we're negative on a three hundred. No 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 no. It it is a good printer, and yeah. it is a leap for it's it's a step forward. I'm not too sure it's a leap forward as yet until I get one and try it. Yeah, but based on what we see on paper, what we've expected, what we do. Uh, I don't think it'll be a leap forward. Um, and when there, there are no alternatives, that normal Pro 10s exist, mm -hmm. then what alternatives have you got, right? I think the the, the uh, adjustable margins is going to be a good feature. Yes. For some of those folks that yes. are going to want to print on fine art paper and are forced to use the manual feeder and then are forced to accept a leading trailing edge wide border. If you mm -hmm. can get rid of that or make that more of an option like the Pro 1000, you know, you can you can disable that. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're taking a chance if you're printing on a heavy material, heavy media. I don't know. 
you know, they, they talk about possible image degradation on the front and the rear of the print uh, due to maybe, you know, paper curl or the print, the paper might actually slip during transport, you get a smear. That happens. That's why they give you a little warning when you choose, say, borderless, for instance. Um, we'll see. I think it's. I think it's, it looks good. And if you're a beginner, you've never owned a printer before, then there's really nothing you can compare it to at this point. So you might as well jump and get it. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a very good printer. It's going to be able to um, give you what you really expect right off the bat. And if you're just getting into experiencing the actual print rather than digital, you're not going to be disappointed. I, I, I see it that way. I see it as a great beginner or entry level printer. But if you own a Pro 10 already and are satisfied with it, unless you're crazy like we are and we need to have more printers, I, I see no point. I'm not going to probably get one. Just, I really don't need it at this point. Well, unless I get one and I say it's fantastic, Joe. You gotta see this. Yeah, then I'll then <laughs> get one, Mike. <laughs> then you the spot if if it if yeah. it pan out. But but the other thing that's interesting is this: Would you pay less price for a Pro three hundred, or step up to the plate and get a Pro one thousand? Mm, step up and get a Pro one thousand. Why? Number one, vacuum pull down. Yeah, wider, wider image. Yeah, right. Wider print. Why the print, but understand that Pro 1000 has over 15,000 nozzles, and the Pro 300 only has 7,680. Mm -hmm. More nozzles means you got to have more ink used to refresh those nozzles. Yeah. So your running costs have to be higher. There's no way around that, folks. Yeah. You got a V8. You got a V12 and you got a four cylinder. Guess which one wastes the most gas to start up? Yeah. The, the V12. Uh, does, that does that mean that, that the, the, if you were to print, print, well, I can hear it up again. Can you turn your speakers down? Do you have your speakers on? Oh, actually, I do. I do. Yeah. I do. There's just a little bit of a delay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, people listening will get annoyed. <laughs> All right. Um, say you got an inch worth of nozzles linearly, and you're printing on basic, not overlaying. You're laying down an inch. I've seen some wide format printers that are laying down that much of a pass, uh, per pass, I mean, that much. And then they advance exactly that amount and lay down another. That's, that's at their lowest quality. But when you choose a higher quality, then you begin to start overlaying. So if you have an inch worth, in other words, linear inch worth of nozzles, and you overlay by half an inch, you're laying dots on top of existing dots. Am I not correct? Is that? Well, not on top, but next to. Dithering. Mixed. Right, dithering. Interleaving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, that slows the print process down because you're making more passes than if you're just advancing exactly one inch. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. That's a, a and you know why they're doing that. Yeah. When they do that, they have more variations of colors that they can produce. Mm -hmm. So typically that would mean not only a smoother gradation, but also more discrete colors that are printed. Mm -hmm. So for many people, if, if they see that there's hardly any difference or none between, say, a standard quality and a high quality print, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say this, but you're not looking close enough. All right? Yeah. And if you, if, if you can't see it, getting into a high-end printer may be not for you. Because that's where the big differences are. You got the nozzle count goes up. You got more gradations possible, potentially more colors. You get potentially smoother color gradations, not only in linearity, but in, in different tones. Right? Now, this is something gamut plots cannot show you. Mm -hmm. 
Many people think gamut plots tell you everything you need to know about a printer. Mm. No, not necessarily so. It, it tells you potentially what it can do, can do, but not it will do. All right? There will be colors in there. If, if you've got very few nozzles, number one, the gamut plot is not going to be as large because you can't do the variations, but also the steps in between colors cannot be made. It's hard for me to explain what's, what's going on. I think also it will come into play when people are getting what looks like a posterization type effect. It's a, it's a banding, but it's not a linear, you know, horizontal yeah. banding. That's usually because of, you know, head alignment problems. But the reality is, is that our eyes are limiting what we can see though. Yeah, on a sky that's very gradual from say one corner of the sky and tonal changes are taking place. You could get some weird like yes, posterization effect if you don't yeah. have enough enough dithering, fine enough dithering of those dots. Well, so that's what's going to hide that. Well, if people look at Netflix, they will see the effect of that roughly. You know, uh, when you look at Netflix and it comes in a very highly compressed stream, mm -hmm. you'll see that when people go into the dark shadows, oh, yeah. it's no longer smooth. Mm -hmm. Or you get a lot of squashing. Yeah. So that's the extreme level of it. But if you imagine that in more discrete steps, that's what you get. But for many people, they don't see it. So it's, it's fine enough we don't pick it up. Yeah. I just thought I would share this with you. We have 88 people here watching. Wow. Point. Yeah. Um, let's, what about, okay, people always, always yell at me, oh, the, all you talk about is Canon. What about the new Epson series that's coming up? What do you have? have I you haven't into, those that into them yet. I you haven't. Probably know more about that. Yeah, I haven't because I just have a feeling those are going to, they're going to be locked out for quite yeah. a while. Um, I haven't heard really positive results or comments about those in Europe that happen to have it. They're already complaining about the lack of volume in the startup cartridges. And because they're both going to be stationary cartridge printers, they're gonna use up all your inks during setup and they only give you half the volume. Already the cartridges are smaller than they should be in their counterparts they're replacing. And you still need X amount of um, milliliters of ink to refill, you know, fill those ink lines and flush out that print head. And by the time you get done doing your test print and your head alignment, you have no ink left. So they they don't mention the fact that you got to have another set of cartridges so, <laughs> sort of waiting yeah. because they're all going to empty pretty much at the same time. Well, when I bought my R3000... As far as results go, those who do have it, they say it's fabulous. Both of them are fabulous printers. So yeah. I'm sure they are. I mean, you, hardly a manufacturer will bring out a printer today mm -hmm. that prints like a dog. Yeah. Right? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The technology in printing is advanced so far that the they're pretty good. Like, he, even this... This hundred dollar TS eighty two twenty, the kind of output you get on it is just fabulous. I mean, considering what you pay, it's it's not bad at all. I mean, let me let me show you. Uh, let me get this thing on. I wasn't quite prepared for this, but um, I was doing some work on this. Okay, well, here's your tough printing. Mm -hmm. That's the OEM with the photo blue, and that's mine, 25X with the photo blue, right? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't spend an inordin inordinate amount of time in matching it perfectly because it is my feeling that the typical purchaser of these printers are pretty happy as long as it gets close enough 
And for those who want to use a, such a machine for a high quality photo printer, I will provide the profiles where it's going to be matched nicely. So it's, I mean, there, there's nothing to really complain about this. These prints, um, I, I, I use this print a lot, the, the one that you referred me to. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very tough, it's a very tough um, print. And there's this image here. It tells you a lot of what's going on. I call it a torture test. Yeah, it's, it's a torture test. But this can tell me a lot of what's going on in the printer mm -hmm. when it's printing and where its shortcomings are. Right. Right. That, that, if you learn how to read that, you can figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be putting that up pretty soon. But I think a month ago, I talked about a little device and Joe's been uh, kind of hinting at this. And um, it's this thing. Primarily aimed at the Pro 100 users. This, my friend, is called a water pick. I've had this for years. And what you do is you fill that with water. And it's got a pump in there. And it basically shoots out a, uh, water in a jet form through this nozzle. Through this wand. So if you have a Pro 100 printhead or any one of the removable printheads from Canon, and soaking does not cure your clogging issue, what you do is you use this water pick. And this these water picks are not that expensive. I mean, I bought a package from Costco. It cost me $80, and I got two of them. So one was for me and one was for my wife. And it does a fabulous job of cleaning between your teeth with as much pressure as you want. And believe me, if you turn this up to 10, the pressure's too high. It'll basically bust your mouth up. So typically, I go between 4 and 6. And that'll blast uh, bits of food from your teeth and between your teeth, and it will actually work like a pressure washer to clean your teeth. So what you do is you basically have the nozzles on the printhead. And again, I stress, you do not use this as a routine thing, OK? It's only if your printhead has gotten clogged and soaking and light washing does not solve it. And of course, Anytime you have a clogged printhead or it's striping or banding, first thing you think about is not the printhead. It's the ink tanks. 99% of the times, mm. if you start getting striping, your ink tank is the issue. Or but if streak. you if you see color streaks. Color streaks, yeah, right. So if, even, if you the ink continue to use, if you continue to use a striping printhead for too long, okay, you develop deposits inside the printhead and soaking will not cure it. I know in the old days, we always prescribed soak in Windex and wash it gently and that'll fix everything. No, not quite. So if you do get that and as a last resort, soaking does not fix it, you use this You can imagine a spray of water coming out. You basically want to go over the, for those that have text, this is the pigment black. Can you hold that up a little bit more? It's right next All to right, you. Sorry. Yeah. The big one is the pigment black in this particular printhead for text. Mm -hmm. And it's, this is the dye ink nozzle. So you will basically spray or use this as a pressure washer along here and you, you go back and forth up and down back and forth diagonal because you basically want to get inside the nozzles 
and see if you can blast the deposits from the heaters directly. Here's the reason why. If you print with a starved uh, print head and it develops deposits, hardly any amount of soaking is going to actually remove those deposits. And most people will say that print head's gone. Got to get a new one. Well, I thought about that and thought about that, and that's when I figured out I'll try to the, not the water pick because by getting into there, I'm basically getting a scrubbing action, just like a pressure washer, to see if I can remove those deposits. And sure enough, for me and numerous other people, it has worked. Now, it hasn't worked for everybody. Just understand that. And you do not want to take what I call level three measures and do that when a level one of just a simple soap could have sufficed because there is some inherent danger in this. If you set it too high, you will, you can't potentially destroy the nozzles. So some sort of balance is required. The other place that you also wanna wash out is in here, the inlets. The reason is because these inlets have a ceramic filter behind the stainless steel um, colored plate. And that can sometimes blast out any sort of ink deposits you might have gotten there, who knows from where. So you always want to wash there, get some liquid coming out of here, then turn it over, wash here. And then when this is coming out clear, then you know you've gotten all of the ink out of the ink channels. And typically I will work. But again, I do not guarantee it'll work for every single printhead. It's something we can, it's in our toolkit. Now, the other thing this, this water pick is also useful for is flushing tanks. So not only can you clean printheads when you get into a jam or you've done something stupid, you can use this in there and this pump will actually pump water through and quickly flush your tanks for you and maintain your tanks. So the key thing in maintaining your Pro 100 is always having perfectly flowing ink tanks. With that, you can print and print and print. As soon as you get banding, stop, take a look at your tanks. If it needs flushing, you flush it. So, this, this, this is, I think, if, if you're at, a, at an advanced level and you've owned your Pro 100 for a number of years, if you don't have any other tool, you don't have to have this, but you can also hook up a line to your, to your laundry tub, whatever. You just basically want to push water through here and flush out your tanks, dry them, and you're good again. Okay, so that's the most important thing in keeping your Pro 100 running in tip-top shape. Now you were using a uh, food dehydrator. Yeah. To help help yeah. the uh, no. problems. After you've washed out your tank, you're going to basically take a paper towel, put it at the bottom. Look! Look what happens. It's sucking out the ink, isn't it? Right? And that's how you're going to remove the water. So you want to suck out as much water out of the sponge using a paper towel. Now, if you have a compressor, you can gently blow air through and push as much water as you can out. But as a last step, you want to suck out as much ink with blotting it out with a paper towel. Then you can put that into a food dehydrator for those who have one, and um, it'll be dry overnight. So while you're while you've removed your cartridges, if if you got to flush one, folks, flush all eight, unless you got a second set, as Jose has always advised. But if you flush one or you flush two, and you only have one set of tanks, flush all of them. 
Yeah, it uses a little more ink. And it's, uh, what, 80 cents per refill. So let's get over that. Okay. So you'll waste a little bit of ink, but you're going to maintain that tank. But while the carts are out of the tank, uh, the carts are out of the printhead, remove the printhead, fill up a dish of Windex with about, say, a quarter inch, and leave the, the printhead in the Windex overnight while your tanks are drying. That way it prevents the, the printhead from drying out and getting real clogs. And when you put it back in, you'll be good. Now, one last step, warning, and a remedial measure. If you are a little bit careless about getting too much water inside the electronic plate here behind here, okay, and you, uh, be, if, if water gets in here and remains wet by the time you put it back into the printer, sometimes you'll get a message saying that you've installed the wrong printhead in the printer. What it means is there's water shorting out certain contacts in here. To fix that, you get a, uh, a can of compressed air and you gently blow through the little cracks there to blow the, the water out and dry it out. You put it back in and that usually fixes it. Okay, so basically I've, I've, I've told you what can go wrong and what how to fix it. Because if you get sloppy when you're soaking or you're washing this, if you get sloppy and you get too much water behind you, you can get an error message. But don't freak out. You just take some compressed air and blow it. But again, I always say this, you use these measures of blowing out the printhead, using the water pick only as a last resort. This should not be pulled out as a first level tool okay only when you've got no other option right the same thing applies to epson printers that have movable carts in other words where you have a spigot that you can literally get a syringe with a tube and physically inject some sort of cleaning fluid with the printhead and i've seen people just blow out a printhead doing that and they were not very careful with a channel that was completely blocked and they forced you know five milliliters of ink uh, of you know windex and delaminated it <laughs> yeah and so no, there, there that was a time when print, also there, there was a time when printheads could epson printheads could take that abuse and it was about until the mid 2000 the r200 the r340 you had in your office behind you Joe, a yeah. month ago, yeah. those printheads are much tougher. And those printheads at that time, Epson had a lifetime warranty on those printheads, provided mm -hmm. used OEM ink. Right. Yeah. Then they moved across and they got a, what they call a higher density printhead. So they had more nozzles, the pizza flexed more, but they were more fragile. And when that appeared, interestingly enough, that lifetime warranty came off from the Epson site. It evaporated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you will see a lot of articles printed way back many, many years ago about people doing the, the trick of yeah. using the syringe, wow. etc. But on a new printer, yeah, be man. careful. What When it was written, it was valid. Yeah. What's valid today is you got to exercise a lot more care and be much more gentle. I still have this adapter that I got from inkrepublic.com a long, long time ago. Basically, you remove your the cartridge on your channel that's you know not responding to normal soaking, and you would insert that. It's 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 basically just the, the front, bottom, and sides of a cartridge, and it's got a port that accepts a syringe. You just insert that in there. Your syringe is already attached, and you push in a little bit. If you feel a little pressure, stop, suck back a little bit, push in, suck back, and you just play around. Again, this is your last resort. This is not something you do as a matter of maintenance every month. No, um, that would not be good. Now, on my 2200s, 
the two the early uh, Stylus Photo 2000. I still got prints from that downstairs. They haven't faded a bit, <laughs> believe it or not. It was one of the first. Wasn't that a pigment printed print printer? The uh, 2000, yeah. The Stylus Photo 2000. Yeah, first um, pigmenting printer. Yeah, and those those printers, the 2200. I used to I used to use that technique all the time. Yeah, it had a problem. I mean, tough as a tough as nails, and unfortunately, a lot of people are having trouble finding OEM light magenta. No one is selling OEM light magenta cartridges, so all of these folks are that refused to upgrade because it was a damn good printer, believe it or not. And um, I used to have four of them, and yeah, I kept them clean by just using that technique, using that adapter. Not a problem. Those things ran forever. I just sold them all because I needed to make room for a couple of other new printers that I was getting. But yeah, those those old printers, Epson printheads, were tough. They're still tough, a lot tougher than Canon. Yeah. Yeah. What about the your what about if the Canon printhead is just damaged? I mean, you know, somebody had streaks and they continue printing thinking that would help and they burn out nozzles or something like that. That that process is just not going to Remember you 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 wrote a huge essay on printer knowledge talking about the snowball effect of having a little bit of build up on a nozzle yeah. or two and not responding to it by stopping and because you're using heat that kind of exasperates the problem and creates even more and eventually gets burnt in place. Is that what you stated? Yeah, well, well let, let me just burn it. go over that, Joe, because you, you just brought up something very interesting. Not everything is known about how printheads clean themselves. I can tell you this. Um, in a Pro 9000 days, if someone showed me a very funny printhead, a uh, nozzle check, I could tell whether or not the print head had deposits in it. And oddly enough, sometimes I would tell people, don't do anything. Just print very lightly and it will clear itself. And sure enough, it cleared itself. So essentially, the idea that once you get these deposits, it's always going to become bad isn't 100% true. Mm -hmm. But it's mostly true because um, there's, a, there's a process in there. If it goes beyond a certain level of duty or you, you push it a little too hard, if it has deposits, it will develop more. But if the deposits are light, very light, the process of printing with good ink can actually dissolve those deposits. But you got to do very light printing. So you print a little bit and you let it sit there. Let it basically rehydrate and redissolve a bit. And you do a little bit again. It's got to be very light printing. Now, if you have deposits and you go whole hog and do a batch job, a commercial of 100 prints while it's been compromised, you're pretty much guaranteed you might knock that head out and have irreversible damage. Now, if you've got 20 prints or uh, whatever the number is and you've soaked it and you ran out of ink and you, you soaked it, it didn't clear the clog, then, you know, we've got the, the, the water pick option now to try to attempt to restore it by some physical scrubbing of those heaters. Okay, now, and that can sometimes work. But the key thing to remember is this. If you've got compromised nozzles and you wash your print head out and you put in new ink tanks in there and you're printing fine, if the nozzles are compromised already, you're going to find that it starts clogging very quickly again. What it keeps coming down to is 
the condition of this cartridge is critical to getting the Pro 100 to really stretch its legs. I mean, it. remember, as, as Joyce told you before many times, when Canon put these cartridges out, they were not meant to be refilled. They wanted to use them once, chuck them away. Because once they, when they knew, they were perfect. There's not an issue whatsoever of ink feed at all. So it isn't like it's a bad design. No. It's simple. It's cheap from Canon's standpoint. And it's hella reliable. And simple. Right? So it's perfect for, for the given task it was meant to do. Now, when we refill it, push it, and we, we refill it over and over and over again, we've got to understand we're pushing the boundaries each time we do it. And when we push the boundaries, sometimes you go over the cliff. Well, we're telling you, please respect that these can't be refilled infinite amount of times. And once you understand that, and you maintain the, the cartridge by flushing them, once every often, how often depends on how much you're doing printing. I would recommend if, if your cartridges have not been flushed and you've been using the printer for two years, definitely you want to think about flushing and renewing them. If you've gone three years, for sure, think about it. You should be flushing it. If it's within a year, it's probably okay. Year and a half, it's probably okay. But you've got to give some thought that we're pushing the boundaries, okay? And when you push too far, you go over the edge. And we don't want you to go over the edge because, you know, Joe touts refilling, I tout refilling, and people always say refilling buggers up your printer. Well, if you know what you're doing, it ain't going to bugger up your printer. As long as you're reasonable about it and you understand how to be a responsible refiller. So if you refill these and you don't refill these properly and it starts bugging up your printer, please don't tell the world that refilling kills your printer. Because, you know, Joe has been trying to teach everyone how to do it properly. I'm in the same place and we've done it for a, long, a lot of years properly. And it hasn't bugged up our printer. Now, some people will say, my printhead is giving me a B200. It's got to be refilling. Refilling killed me, killed my printhead. No, if it's an electronic fault, it's an electronic fault. Understand, folks, that most electrical problems on cannons are electrical problems. The printer does not sense ink. It doesn't know whether you put company B ink, company C ink, or company D ink in there. It just wants to work. Okay, no, not all inks are the same, but still, that's not going to cause an electrical problem. Unless the ink is really bad, then you get an overheating printhead. But printers do go bad. I just lost an MX870 um, a week ago. While, no, two weeks ago. While it was printing normally, boom, it just stopped. Tells you to shut off the printer and turn it back on again. Did that, nothing happened. <laughs> Pulled the plug, tried it again, nothing happened. It started up and then just gave me a B203. Nothing I did wrong. And I, I've owned that printer about seven, eight years I've been using it. So, surely enough, the print had burned out. I got a spare printhead I, I had gotten from a, an old IP3600, I think. Popped it in there, went back working perfectly fine. So electrical failures do happen, and it happens to the best of us. There's nothing that we did that caused it. It's just like when your smartphone goes bad or your TV goes bad. Is it because of the program or the channel you were watching that caused the TV to go bad? Oh, sometimes electronics just give up the ghost. Unless okay, it's a, unless it's a really, really bad, bad show, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then you hope it's it goes bad on you, right? Yeah. 
Well, uh, I hope monitors that people are watching this on TVs or whatever doesn't go bad, right? <laughs> yeah. On the, um, when I was learning about Canon printers and the 6400 was like the one of the best uh, units that they have, IPF, you know, Im image program. I found out that they have dual print heads and they need to be changed every two and a half years. They you 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 will kill that printhead about every two and a half years worth of use. It depends, you know. We're talking about high volume roll printing, you know, constantly. But yeah, the printhead will just die, and you have to replace it. That's why they make them user replaceable. Imagine if they were like Epson printers, you know. Well, the, the user replaceable and on, on the pro line now they've got the built in densitometer. Yeah, so you pop a new printhead in. Self calibrate, bang! You're back to factory spec. Now talking about that, um, I want to. Well, people will say I'm going to be negative oh, on Epson oh, printers. Wait a minute. One of the features for the Pro 300 was automatic skew correction. Oh yeah! So the lateral sensor that that senses the edge of a piece of media traveling through the printer. That edge has to remain exactly in the same position. It cannot change. Otherwise, it's going to be skewing. And you don't want that with a roll printer. Of course not. Uh, that's why Epson, my P800 rejects every load that I try to when I'm, when I'm installing a roll of paper. Because it's actually advancing like six, seven inches. And checking the edge of that paper to make sure that edge does not move laterally. It has to remain in one position. That means that the roll is not skewed. How does the P three hundred the pro the P the Pro three hundred perform that auto correction of skewed media? And we're talking about sheets here. I don't know, Joe, but how it does that. But that's I don't know, Joe, but as, features. as a mechanical engineer, the first thought that comes to my mind is I would have some digital adjustment on the front pickup rollers. So I would have it like compress a little more than the other on either, either right. side. So that it would and drag a little bit more? Yeah, oh, I, I think that it's possible to do that. I don't know how the Canon engineers did it. I don't know exactly how it worked. It would, it would still have to detect, physically detect optically the edge. Yeah, I, I would yeah. think so. That's the only other way you could do it. Say you're running 30, how many inches is it, the max now? 36 or 39. Yeah, so you're loading a sheet of, off of a roll of paper, and it begins to skew somehow, automatically, it's supposed to <laughs> fix that. I don't know well, how. We don't know the limits of how much it can adjust. I mean, if yeah. it's going this way, nothing's going to fix it. be, <laughs> an, you know, an extreme amount. Right. Yeah, so that was one of the big claims also. I don't know. Well, I'm sure they've got something in there. I mean, it's, again, it's not a negative on the Pro 300. It's a fantastic printer. They've packed a lot yeah. of technology in there for an entry-level printer. But is it worth $899 relative to what you can pay for or we've paid for Pro yeah. 10s in the past? And that's the problem that's the for, question. for a beginner. I don't, I don't use the word beginner as a negative term. Because there's professional photographers that have never, ever right. hit a single image. We all start somewhere. Yeah. So I, I know people that are produce majestic looking images. Oh, my God. I, I could only wish. But they don't know squat about printing. So they want to know, what should I get? This might be the best printer for them to get. You know, at a thousand bucks almost. Plus paper, you know, um, you can't go wrong with it. But I mean, it's a little pricey. Um, if you're just going to be a once a month printer, then I, I wouldn't suggest you get that printer. You would have to be someone who is a serious amateur, but has never printed before. Don't know squat about what printer they should be. You know, they don't even know how to spec out a printer to choose between models or brands. They don't know what this means or what that means. So you know what I mean? So they, they yeah. I just recently did a call with some, I actually did it on live, on uh, StreamYard. 
And the guy wants to know, how do I choose between the P900 and the R3 and the Pro 1000? So I gave him all the pros and cons of both printers. I said, do what I did. I bought both. <laughs> you know, <laughs> of course, he, you know, he's not going to do that. I said, well, if you are going to print long beyond 25.6 inches, then forget about the Pro 1000 unless you upgrade the uh, firmware and that's 47 or 49 or 47 inches, something like that. But that doesn't mean roll support. You see what I mean? So if you don't do panoramas, then I would probably suggest you get the Pro 1000 just simply because I think that extra blue ink and that red ink just outperforms the, the Epson nine color ink set. You know, actually 10 color now that they added, what did they add? Chrome optimizer? Some kind of a gloss? The, 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 I haven't kept up. Yeah, the P9, the P900, I think, has green. Is it? No, it has, um, it has no black ink switch valve. So it has a 10 channel printhead, nine color, and then I think it's a gloss. I may be wrong. Again, I haven't really checked that deeply in it. It's just the, the big thing is no black ink switch valve. Well, talking about switch valves, something did happen to me since our last uh, appearance in the show a month ago. My R3000 died. Oh, man. It finally died. Here's what happened. I went to refill the tanks, top and put them back all in there. Yeah. And I could never get a good nozzle check. Basically, the bottom half, not exactly half of all the channels, I cannot restore. Wow. So I left it there overnight, came back the next morning. It printed better, but nothing could restore it. I think one of the dampers or gasket is now has been mis dislodged. And um, it's the printer. Let me see if I can point it out here. It's, oh, oh there you go. It's that one there. That's my R3. Yeah, right behind there. you. Yeah. Right. Way back there, right? Yep. 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 So, again, folks, it's nothing I did. It's just refilling. That's yeah. it's right there. That, that one. Yeah. Right there. Right next to your sign. Right. Your, your, yeah. That's my R3000. That's my Pro 1 here. Mm -hmm. That's my P600 here. Uh, that's my Pro 10 up there. That's my Pro 100. That's my Maxify bulk printing. Mm -hmm. Um that's my what's that? that's my Epson no down here after the P600 down here it's my Artisan 1430 that's my Epson SP 1400 that's my Epson R2880 waiting for me to fix it behind this right there that the Printer tray is blocking. Let me take up my printer tray. Right there. That's my P800. Below that is my Pro 9000 in the bottom level here. That's my Exxon XP. Oops. 600. That's my R3880. That's my Pro 9500. Below that, on the ground, where it's most stable, is my Pro 1000. That's my, oops, IP 4500, CLI 8 days. And, oops, that's my TS 5020 and TS 8220. And below that, I have an MP980, an Artisan 50. And to my left, I have a Workforce 3640. So 
for those of people who think I'm negative on Epson, and I just hate Epson, nothing's that's very far from the truth. Okay, I just do a job on Canon. I also do a phenomenal job on Epson as well. So understand, I, I'm, uh, there are times when I would recommend an Epson. There are times when I would not. Yeah. And, and if you are a very, very sporadic printer, not to show Epson is really the printer for you. All right. I, let me let me just say, I, I just did a video that I posted I think it was last night, maybe this morning. I don't remember. Last night. And um, I ran a new type of vinyl media from Breathing Color. It it looks and feels like a window shade, I swear. But it's inkjet coated for water-based pigment inks. Matte black, of course. I loaded the roll. La actually, last Sunday before the live stream, I loaded it the roll on my PA-100, but I had not printed on it. The last time I printed on it was when I was doing their canvas prints. I had a 10-foot roll of their canvas. Uh, it's called Live Canvas Mat, L-Y-V-E. That's what they call it. And yesterday afternoon, before my computer died, I went ahead and printed an image for my son. It was a graphic image. Guess what the PA-100 did before it decided to even begin to print? A big cleaning cycle, folks. Yep. Automatic. People think it's only Canon. Oh, get an Epson. You will not have to worry about baloney. That PA-100 threw a big cleaning cycle, and guess what? It started printing perfectly after that. Had it not done that, I probably would have had missing nozzles here and there and would have wasted a foot worth of the uh you know the new uh, vinyl material which by the way is amazing it's really amazing i'm going to figure out what the hell am i going to use that for but uh yeah and it prints beautifully it's like it's just heavier consistency than normal canvas uh so you have to sort of use a canvas media choice for it but anyway, yeah, it threw a cleaning cycle. Hey, there you go. Proven. I should have photographed it. <laughs> just, just as an interesting thing that I had the 300 and the P600, R3000, P600. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, I ran an experiment. And I determined under the same identical conditions, because they're just one on top of each other, the 3000 and the P600 here, the R3000 always needed more printing if you're going to prevent so-called Epson clogs. And I'll go through an Epson clog for you one day, what actually happened, because it's not what many people think. Okay? So the P600 is more, much more resistant to so-called clogging, Epson clogging. Now, the P800 and 3880 are very different animals. They have that pressurized system, and that pressurized system is excellent at preventing the so-called Epson clogs. And what is it doing? It makes sure that the ink is always pressurized towards the nozzle. And I'll go through that. It's We don't have enough time to cover that. But understand the 3880 and the lesser Epson printers turn the light off are, are very very different animals from the typical epson line okay so so those people who think we're always negative on epson or i have been uh not quite true it's just that they're a different beast you got to learn how to live with them and they'll scare some people but uh, before i leave joe i got a little story for you yesterday someone called me up from New York, and um, he told me he's thinking of getting into refilling, and he's a photographer. So he said he had a Pro 9000 he has not used for two years because I had to dig out uh, what the story is before 
And I kind of suspected that refilling may not be for him. So I got to understand whether or not he has the, not ability, but the mindset to proceed in refilling. So he's got a, a two-year-old 9,000 that has not, sorry, a pro 9,000 that had not been used for two years. He put it away. And when he put it away, it apparently had already run out of inks. Mm. And that's the reason why he stopped using it. And with this COVID situation, he can't do a lot of shoots, so he figured he's going to get into refilling. So I thought about this, and I said, you know, this chap is trying to get into refilling in the worst of time, not from the standpoint of what we're having here with the pandemic, but the worst of time in that we don't know the condition of the printer. If it was empty and put away for two years, High likelihood the printhead is clogged. So he's going to have to learn how to unclog the printhead. His cartridges are dry. He's going to have to learn how to flush the cartridges all from the get-go. And I had to explain to this to him for about half an hour what he's looking for before he wants to do it. Because he also indicated that he's been making prints and he doesn't mind paying $11, $14 for a print. So... Again, if he can afford it, maybe he shouldn't be getting into all this trouble of refilling. But after all of that, it occurred to me to ask him, by the way, what operating system are you using? He tells me, Apple. And he just got a new computer. Apparently, from what, when I looked it up right away, the Pro 9000 is no longer supported by Apple on the latest version and previous version or something. I'm, I'm not familiar with the Apple, but I told them, you better check to make sure you, before you start getting into this, that you can use it. And I don't think he can use it, even if he spent the time to restore his Pro 9000. Yeah. So I spent, <laughs> I, I wasted Poor guy. half an hour before I discovered he might not be able to use it. Yeah, he would have to use some kind of emulator and, and run I don't both, know. both platforms at the same time. But, yeah. Uh, mm. But but I what it is is that when people call me to ask me whether I should be getting into it, I try to understand who they are and whether or not it's for them because Yeah. Yeah, I sell inks, I sell refill kits, but I, I also appreciate that refilling is not for everyone. And if it's not for you, don't get into it and start whining and complaining about getting your hands dirty. If you uh, see, it's, it's, uh, I touch the cartridge and my hands are dirty. Of course, that's par for the course, folks. If you yep. if, if you're scared of this, which when I go take a shower is going to disappear, then I don't want to be negative. It's probably yep. not for you. Now, many people just don't have. I mean, I could understand. I've had some much older than me, uh, I'm elderly by, by age, uh, but some folks that just don't have the manual dexterity to, you know, maybe they have some palsy or whatever, and they, you know, they shake a little bit. They, they may not be able to modify a CLI 42 cartridge for their Pro 100 they got. And, you know, they may end up just ruining the cartridge and have to start over again or buy some cartridges from my buddy, Rick Johnson or whatever. Those are ready to be used, but they just don't want to go through the trouble or they're, they think they're not able to perform the necessary uh, modifications to be able to get into this you know, mode of printing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a rude awakening for many folks. They just don't realize what it takes, you know, what it takes to get into this. Even if you, even if you are never gonna refill, it's expensive. Printing is not cheap. So, anyways, I'm going to see the whole show. It's six o'clock. On that, on that sad note, we're gonna say goodbye to our good friend Mike. And I wish everybody happiness and they say yeah. stay safe these days. And yeah, stay yeah. safe, healthy. There's and, a lot of uh, there's a lot of fools out there doing silly things, and then well, get still today. Yeah. All right. So goodbye and
We'll see you in a month. Best, best of everything. Okay, right. see ya. Yep. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed this. This is this is our bedroom. I'm in my bedroom right now, and you all know why. Um, let me go back and uh, answer a couple of the questions that had come up. I'm glad that so many people were watching again. This happens once a month. Maybe by the next time we do this, we should be able to be back downstairs in my normal room. Um, I did see a few pictures. There was a lot, uh, not pictures, uh, comments. There were a lot of um, posts about the uh, P300. And again, like Mike said, we're not being negative. Um, the Pro 300, that is. Um, it's just that we were expecting possibly a little bit more. Uh, I like the fact that it has a screen built in finally on it. And um, they did the smart thing to uh, just continue using the same kind of uh, cartridge. I'm sure the chips are different. They're not about to do a dumb thing and, you know, use the same chips with the same coating because they know they are being reset by us refillers using a red setter re resetter. Uh, they're not about to do that. So they're going to have to, we're going to have to rely on uh, disabling ink monitoring. And you just got to be careful. When you do that, you can continue to print, of course. But remember that you can fill those cartridges as often as you wish. You can top them off if you want. And you could do it visually, or you can do it by weighing them as you're dribbling ink on the back port of that cartridge. Again, if you had told me, I want to refill, that's the printer that I would suggest, the Pro 10. And now the Pro 300 promises to be even better. Um, I don't know whether anyone is going to come up with a black ink that supposedly matches the quality of their matte black ink. I don't know whether it's going to have the same weird system where if you are choosing a regular matte paper, will it use photo black or will it use matte black to print with? I don't know. Um, with the regular Pro 10, of course, Mac, Mike tried to explain it to us last time, and it's still a bit of a mystery. There's a lot of compositing taking place to create a black. So you might have to then rely on using matte media, but using the fine art mode, and then you have to load it in the manual feeder. Okay, that's an extra step. Once you do that, then it triggers matte black ink. And I think so far from what he has said, the Pro 10 prints much better. And also you will be able to adjust your margins. Finally, they kind of gave up on that and allow you to not have to accept that super wide 30 milliliter millimeter or 35 millimeter border. Those are huge. And if you're doing only, you know, A A4 or A5 prints, that's the last thing you want. You know, letter size prints, that's a huge loss of, of image in that piece of paper because of that wide border. Okay, everybody was, let's see. And I did bring this up, but, you know, it's a, it's one of those things that I don't think Epson is ever going to resolve. The lack of, um, let me see, I think it was the lack of um, 2200 uh, light magenta cartridges. Those, that printer is ancient. As much as I loved it, it's ancient, and it's it's time for them to just completely stop. I think they stopped supporting it quite a while ago. So, you know, whatever is available out there, that's all that's going to be available for the 2200. And it's going to be even worse as time passes. There's going to be just less and less and less uh, when it comes to OEM cartridges for that printer. If you're able to refill them, and it is possible, uh, it takes a little gadget that you can now get, I think, from a site in England. They used to be available here. And I did a very long video uh, basically demonstrating how to use that to allow you to refill those cartridges. You will have to find light magenta ink from some other similar K3 type Epson printer and extract the ink from those. 
and replace it. I'm getting a set of um, profile patches that I'm not going to be able to do until I fix my computer. Uh, and those were printed in such a printer, the 2200 using light magenta ink from another source. It was actually Epson, but it was also OEM. So let's see. I'm not going to be able to say hello to everybody here. I'm just looking for questions that I can show here and try to address. So Sebastian Kloon, he's been with us before. Another live stream round with you and Mike. I changed today my first cartridge on the Pro 100. It was gray. It's empty, light gray almost, but every other one not even half. Magenta is still 100%. And that's what I'm talking about, folks. The, the way that the colors are, are used during normal printing is like this. There is no rhyme or reason, okay? So you're never going to get, and when I get asked, hey, Jose, how many prints can I get out of a full set of cartridges? I said, I don't know. I have no clue because that full set of cartridges is not going to be used up equally. You're not going to reach a point where you're empty and you printed 100 prints. No, it's going to be the gray going empty first. You replace that. Now that one is full and the other ones will be at different rates and so on and so on. You get to the point after a couple of cartridge changes where everything is gonna be at all kinds of levels. And that's why I always you know, stress that get a second set of cartridges, buy them already, process for you, okay? The link is on my description, so just look there. And then you can have a full set refill to the top, reset, when one of those cartridges, and do not let them go empty, do not let them go empty. Mike failed to discuss this, and I, he could have gone for hours. But what happens is that the ink out of the sponge then is drawn out because there's no more liquid ink to replace it. As a deficit is created, automatically ink enters into the sponge. And after you are done printing, it saturates that sponge to the correct level. Okay, if you let it go beyond empty on the liquid chamber, then there's no more ink to replenish the sponge, and you continue printing and you continue creating a deficit which now cannot be um, taken care of. Basically, so you end up with those little fibers on those sponges, they trap air beautifully. And after cycle and cycle and cycle of doing this, you're going to create a situation where the sponge no longer, no longer can absorb ink, you have to reflush, okay? You have to reflush and start from fresh. That's one thing. Never let it go empty. As soon as one cartridge reaches low, you see that low warning, stop printing, remove all eight, and replace them with your eight that you just refilled, okay? They were standing, waiting anxiously to be put to use. Put them in, now you're back to full, 100%. Better than when you even set up the printer initially, because you used up some ink to prime that printhead. So even better than that, it'll be ready to roll. And then what you have now is a set of seven cartridges at various levels. And then the one that was low, that sponge is still saturated. It has never been allowed to absorb air because there was no more ink to replenish it. So don't even go I don't even go to the point where it's low. I replace it before it is low. Okay, you will get like a blinky light, okay, indicator. If you if you lift the lid, you will see a couple of cartridges blinking. Replace the whole thing, assuming, of course, you have a second set already prepped and ready to go. All right, let's see how many more. This is a very small spacing here, folks. So you have to um, bear with me. We still got 70 folks here. I'm glad that people are still hanging around, even though Mike left. He is the man. The guy knows more than uh, I will ever learn. I think he forgets more stuff than I will ever, ever learn. So Henry Stoffel from Maine is here, user of the P800. Let's see if he has a question. He said, I like the 80 milliliter cartridges compared to the smaller. Yeah, that's that's the thing. 
I don't know why they just basically reduced the footprint of those printers. And going back to the Canon Pro 300, keep this in mind as well. The printer is much lighter. So what did they do to reduce the weight? Now who's calling? That's another thing I got to put up with. So what did they do to reduce the weight? Think about it. They actually added a densitometer to the um, printhead. So that's one addition, a little bit of extra weight there. But what did they do to reduce the weight to a more manageable uh, you know, weight? Well, when you have a lot of metal parts, which are very dur durable, you have a lot of weight. So did they replace parts that were made out of metal with plastic? I really don't know. And, you know, there is one Canon printer that I am not even going to mention, but it's very cheaply built. And a lot of people are considering it. And it's just cheaply built, folks. Compared to the Pro 100, the Pro 100 is a Sherman tank compared to this printer. And it is a 13 capacity, 13 inch capacity printer as well, using dye inks. I, I, I'm not going to mention which one. But yeah, uh, you got to be careful when they say, you know, much lighter weight. Well, how did you reduce the weight? What did you compromise? Basic question. This is from Will Carson. I'm only going to go through the questions because, again, I think we might even make the three hour, uh, hopefully. Uh, basic question, OEM Pro 10. Is the Pro 1000 Red the same as the Pro 10 Red? No, it is not. And Mike mentioned that as well. The Pro 300 Red is the same as the Pro 1000 Red. But no, these two Reds are actually slightly different. And so what I am able to get away with for my Pro 10 is that for a long time, I used to buy... Pro 1 empty cartridges, and by empty, I mean that they were removed, whether it was prematurely or not, from these printers, these Pro 1s that they had in this one college. And one gentleman that has stopped doing this for me used to gather them all up and then sell them to me for like 50 cents a piece. Then I would modify them and resell them at a slightly higher price, of course, so that they can be used with the fatter um, and I mean, much fatter Chinese chips because they just won't sit flush unless I machine them to allow that new chip, the replacement chip to sit nice and flush. I could extract OEM ink out of those cartridges. And guess what? The Pro 1 inks match the Pro 10 inks. The only mismatch is that the Pro 10 gray is the same as the Pro 1 dark gray. The Pro 1 has dark gray, gray, and light gray, three grays. Wow, talk about beautiful transitional tones, okay? Yeah, the more grays you have, it, that comes into play. So yeah, um, that's the only way I could get away with um, printing with OEM. I'm running out of that stuff, though, so I will have to find some red, and I'll probably will have to re-profile everything. I'll have to find some OEM red. Maybe the OEM red for the Pro 1000, I could use it, but then I'll have to re-profile because it doesn't quite match the same, uh, I should say, chromatically the same red as the you know original Pro 10 and Pro 1 red. And I don't know whether those reds are the same as the 9500 Mark II either. So Really, really don't know. It's hard to tell. I know that Mike has done all kinds of smears on paper and actually has measured uh, with a spectrophotometer to get the correct uh, values and any different values from all of these different inks. Canon Pro 100 firmware update 2.031. Any indication if it prohibits third-party inks? I have no clue. You will know when you install it. That's all I can say. And I would not ever install a firmware unless it specifically tells me 
what it is addressing. And often it'll just say improved printing. It's just like with drones, improved flying experience. What the hell does that mean? I have no clue what that means. So be weary if you are refilling and your printer's operating perfectly fine. Don't, don't upgrade the firmware unless you absolutely need to. Greetings from the Highlands of Scotland. I am currently looking for a 17-inch printer, I assume, given that the Pro 313-inch release, do you guys see Canon releasing a Pro 1000 replacement? Soon, if not, the P900 seems best. I have not heard a word about anything concerning the Pro 1000. The only improvement they could possibly make is a roll adapter. You see, that would be the only thing, and that would have to be something added to the rear that would increase the footprint. You would need a bigger table, even bigger than I'm running right now, which is like a four foot by six foot table, maybe seven feet. Yeah, and I'm almost to the rear of the uh, <laughs> the edge of the table as it is right now, and no roll adapter. So that would have to be the only thing they would have to add in my book. And it already uses 10, you know, 12 channels. It's got every bell and whistle you can think of. Um, yeah, I don't know. The P900, yeah, that might be the choice for you. Keep in mind, it's going to probably be locked. And they may do that even in European units. I have no idea what they are planning on doing regardless or regarding that. And be aware that nobody suspected the P800 would be blocked. And so units of these refillable cartridges were being sold to the, all these U.S. owners of the P800. And they worked until it came time to reset. Then they did not work anymore. So yeah, be very weary of that. Waiting for the rebate offers. I went to Murphy's camera Friday to see rebates. Instead, I found a new printer. Okay. Did you physically go there or only online? What I have heard, and this is just, you know, word of mouth, you have to talk to someone specifically inside the store on the phone to get this fantastic price, okay? And uh, also, as Mike stated, these um, so-called Pro 10s are going to be gone. Pro 100s are gone pretty much now as far as you know new units from canon coming out i think they stopped so there might be something new in the pro 100 who knows what are they going to do to the pro 100 add an lcd screen i don't know what else they would do um it might be interesting who, who knows i don't see the pro 10 murphy site anymore maybe you can call in yeah i think that's that's the way you do it I think that's the way you do it. They want you to do that. Will the Pro 300 software work on the Pro 100? I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, if you mean the, the Print Studio Pro, sure. But the driver, of course, is going to be different. It's going to be specific to each printer. We are using the Pro 10 to print on transfer paper for the fashion industry. What is the best profile to use for our purpose? I have no idea. It would have to be made for that transfer paper. And what kind of paper are you talking about? Like heat transfer? It could not be possibly be um, uh, sublimation because you cannot use sublimation inks on Canon printers. So if you can let us know what you mean by that. You know, again, a profile would have to be made for that profile using that printer. For that paper, I mean, using that printer for it to be specific. Unless a transfer paper vendor has ICC profile. Yes, that's what I said. So they would have to create profiles for that paper, for that printer as well. Pro 300 nozzle check looks like the Pro 1000. That's good to know because that tells us that the uh, there's a similar print engine involved.
that's what I would do. Leave it on auto and, and just hope for the best. Uh, figure out what the surface of the paper looks like and just pick something similar. I think it means just letting the driver control color. Should I buy a Pro 10 or a Pro 100 for the first photo printer? Uh, it, it depends. If you see yourself ever wanting to print on some finer type media, like something along matte or, or a rough texture type paper that requires black matte pigment ink, then your only choice is Pro 10 between those two models. If you're going to print on nothing but glossy, luster, satin, anything with a gloss, Pro 100 is just perfect for that and will serve you very, very well. How do I locate you on Facebook? There is a link on my video descriptions for the Facebook group. And also on the main channel of my, my main channel page, there are some little icons on the, on the art. And one of them has a big F on it. That's Facebook. And then you just join and I would approve you when I see your request. Yeah, so that's, again, you, you're, you're on your own when it comes to that because the paper manufacturer has not provided you with some sort of profile for that printer. Uh, if that paper is supposed to be used generically with any printer, they're not going to even bother. Not like fine art type photo papers. They will specifically make profiles for just about every printer out there that can that is compatible with that type of paper. Okay. I call it your bluff now. You are totally going to get a Pro 300. Nah, I don't think so. I'll let you guys know. If Mike comes back and says, Joe, you got to get one of these printers. Okay, fine. But like I said, I already have a Pro 10 and I'm, I'm in love with it. Does anyone know now does Pro... Oh, air, air, you mean a vacuum uh, paper advance? No, that's not one of the features that I saw listed. Mike, what about the Pro 10 waistbands? Do you have any estimation how long they last since there is no way to reset the counter as for the 9500? There used to be a way, but now there isn't. Um, how long do they last? Well, let me give you a, a, an idea. My Pro 100 is going to be seven years old this coming month, August. So far, so good. Okay. Printhead is good. And so far, no warnings about. And there's no way that I can even check. Okay. I, I You know, there are utilities you can use on Epson printers that will allow you to check. And they give you kind of a numeric value, whether you're getting close to that high number or not, but not with the Canon printers. Precision color shipping to Africa. Well, you have to use a third-party shipper. There are two of them listed on the checkout area. When, you, when you're about just about ready to check out and pay, you will see two links. Yep. All righty. Agent X says, I, ha I have actually expedited CLI 42 cartridges drying by injecting low pressure air from a compressor into the fill hole. Yeah, that's that's been done before. And I think that's what uh, Mike was referring to as well. Otherwise, it could take like three days to dry. What temperature would you set your food dehydrator at the at the 
same temperature you would use for food, I would say. Um, it could be even, you know, 90, 100 degrees. It, it would be fine. No problem. How often should the CLI-42 cartridges be flush when they start giving you problems? Okay. And those problems will come about by you insisting on printing after they are low. Okay. Don't do that. The, the air that infiltrates those sponge fibers block ink. They will cause ink starvation. They will ca cause streaks. And if really bad enough, they will cause printhead damage. So how often do you flush them? As soon as you see a problem, uh, it depends how much you print. It could be it could be every few months if you print like hundreds of prints a day and go through multiple changes. I would say after like 30 refills, flush them. But I just picked that number out of the air. Okay, I have upgraded to the to an Epson P800, but I still want to use my Epson 2200. Where can I find ink? You can't. It's just, it's not made anymore. That printer is something like 13, 14 years old, okay? So you're not going to really find a lot of uh, OEM inks. So the only option is refillable cartridges and third-party inks. Uh, Precision Colors, I think, has refillable cartridges. Maybe, maybe not. If not, a company that has a ton, a ton of support for many, many printers, probably more than any other company, is Inkjet Carts. Like a cart, Inkjet Carts, one word, dot c dot us so and her, the guy that runs that company uh what's his name um i forgot it's been such a long time but yeah they support a ton a ton of printers some of some of them are forgotten on my first set of pcse cards on the Pro 100 and really happy so far. I downloaded your profiles for the Pro 100 and they perform better than any other profile I have used. Yeah, Mike takes great pride in his uh, profiles. If you're not getting good results, you're doing something wrong. JEG 569, P700 has photo black, matte black, gray, light gray, plus six colors. What are those six colors? Okay, what what extra are we getting? That I do not know. I thought one of those was a, a gloss enhancer, but maybe I'm wrong. Ah, okay, so it might be the violet ink. Okay, no optimizer. That makes sense. I totally forgot about that. Now. Oh, boy, that will make a day and night difference. Oh, yeah. Too bad it doesn't have red also. Because that puts it in the same violet ink. That's really blue, folks, okay? Blue optically is purple. It's what we call purple. So by adding a proprietary, I'm going to keep calling it blue. I don't care. Ink, just like the Pro 1000 and higher, you can get some ridiculous uh, results when your images have some very demanding purple and deep blue colors. The difference is night and day. Compared to the P800, yeah, P800 sucks on that particular type of image, okay? Period. It just cannot handle that kind of neon-looking deep blue colors the Pro 1000 did. I did a video where I demonstrated that side by side. It, it was kind of mind blowing, and all all that because of the proprietary blue ink. So in this case, we'll call it violet. Hello, Jose, Mike's, and Rumi's from St. John's, Newfoundland. Mike, I am using an R three thousand. I was wondering how it compares to the Pro ten. 
The R3000, of course, is your, your typical uh, K3 uh, uh, ultra-chrome pigment inks printer. The Pro 10 has red ink. So the Pro 10 has red ink plus chrome optimizer. Uh, the Pro, the R3000 does not use a gloss enhancement. And let me tell you, if you are really a careful, you know, pixel peeper, if you will, you will notice that on certain media, there is quite a bit of gloss differential on all of these Epson printers, okay? Except for the R2000 and the P400. They use a gloss enhancer. So that evens out any kind of difference in gloss, what, what would you call it? Um, I had that term right here. Anyway, you know what I mean. Certain colors are just glossier than others. Your black, your photo black is quite glossy. And often what happens is that it will outgloss the surface of the paper. So you will see that difference. By using a, a, a gloss enhancer, it will kind of even out. If you have any parts on your images that have what I call a 355 highlight, in other words, it's just white. There's no ink going to be applied over that highlight you will see gloss differential. But by having a gloss enhancer, you will not see that because the white portion, even if it's just a cloud with 355, 355, 355, no density whatsoever, it will look duller than the ink. The ink is glossier than the paper. Yeah. So by applying that gloss enhancer, gloss optimizer with Epson printers, two of them, and of course, all of your pro line of uh, Epson new family of pigment printers have chrome optimizers. That will disappear. It will be perfectly even. Even if you put it under glass and you kind of change the angle, you, you will be able to see the gloss differential. So if you can put up with that, if you're just going to print a matte paper, then the P9900 or the P800 will suffice or the R3000 for that matter. doesn't really matter. It's just a slight difference in gloss that you just cannot compete with. You just can't when it comes to a Canon printer. Yeah. So true. That's why it just, it just makes no sense to continue using these ancient printers. Yeah, they were good at the time. They actually were quite excellent. It's just that it's not worth it anymore. Here's Rick Johnson. He's the guy that preps those cartridges for you. I think, I think he might be sold out. Anything on Canon 3.031? Yeah, like we said, uh, we have no clue. We will know until when somebody tries to do it, then they will find out, and especially if they are refilling. Until then, you know, Canon is not going to tell you. Oh, by the way, folks, if you install this new uh, firmware, yeah, you're going to get um, better, better margin control. Oh, and by the way, you won't be able to refill any longer. No, they're not going to say that. They're going to let you be the guinea pig. Yeah, that's the truth. I I'm still lucky enough to have most of the printers that I still have. I don't have as many as Mike. I think he outdid me by twice as many printers. Um, the ones that I do have, you can still get drivers for. So it's good. All right, we saw that. So I need to move down further. Is the Pro 100 Pro 10 compatible with Windows 10? Of course it is. Of course. Perfectly compatible. Does the nozzle check on the Pro 10 reset? Huh? The 60, oh, no, of course not, not at all. 
In fact, printing does not do anything. We now know that, okay? It does not do anything to to stop that. Um, it will it will it will happen regardless. Uh, what printers are you considering uh, for black and white or monochrome? You need a printer with some gray inks. In other words, some light versions of black like the Epson printers and the Canon printers that do have grays have. Otherwise, it's very difficult to produce a nice neutrally uh, linear print in, in monochrome. It will tend to change tones across across the whole tonal range. You may end up with, you know, like a cooler, darker section of tones, maybe neutral and then maybe warm once you get to the... Uh, very uh, light shades. It will not be linear. So the R2000, the P400, are not good printers for monochrome printing. Now, you could tweak them by producing a profile, and that will tend to help, okay? But it will, it's not going to solve the problem. It's not going to be like using, you know, gray inks on a printer such as the ones that we are discussing. We were talking about the, yeah, the weight. So changing from metal to plastic, less weight. But, you know, you got to do it. You got to think structurally and and not just, just because change something that should be made of metal into plastic. That, that, that would not be good. Or you can use aluminum. Aluminum, although, is less likely to uh, last especially on parts that are rubbing and touching and moving, moving parts. Uh, that would not be a good choice. Uh, thanks for all the knowledge. My, by any chance, there will be some class for the Epson P9000. Oh, no, I don't. That's, that's a monster. I don't have that kind of a room. And that is, you don't mean the P900. If you, if you mean the P900, uh, then, you know, very likely, maybe, if I get one. But again, um, do I really need one? Mm. There will have to be such a demand that I would say, okay, I just got to get one just to keep up with the uh, information that I could be putting out. What do you think about the Pro 2100, even older, even older? Um the, the 2200 was better than the 2100, and the 2200 was very, very slow to print. It was great. It produced good results. I think it only used seven cartridges, um, and you had to manually swap the blacks, which was actually pretty good. I didn't mind doing that. But, yeah, just, just move up, move up. There's so many better printers nowadays. It's very nice paper when it's glued to a matte board and framed. It looks very, it looks fine, hard to tell from Epson fine art papers. What are we talking about? Are we talking about that, that vinyl that I was mentioning earlier? It's a perfect paper for selling pictures of icebergs to tourists. Not too many tourists around this year though. Again, what, what are we talking about? Yeah, if you have inks for it, yeah. Again, remember, the 2200 cartridges are going to disappear pretty soon. There's already a shortage. In fact, there are none of the light magenta, and you need the light magenta to be able to print. No, it's not difficult to use. Any printer is not difficult to use. You just have to learn the process. You have to learn the workflow. That's why I have... A very um, not not huge playlist, but a basic printing playlist. If you look at my list of playlists, that's hard to say. You will find a basic printing playlist. And there you, you start from theory all the way to the end. And 
it will walk you through what you need to know, what you need to do in order to get consistent, predictable results. You cannot be guessing what my prints are going to come out like. You should know how they're going to come out. And that is all the result of very specific workflow techniques that you stick to daily, okay, and never change. Cindy, I'm sorry, but I'm still confused about getting the Pro 10 to use matte black ink. Do you have to use fine art? Yeah. Yes, you do. Apparently, you do. That's that's that is the uh, the uh, answer to that one. And yeah, um, giant margins. Sorry, uh, the Q Image Ultimate has a, a a way to to bypass that. It's a little bit iffy and a little dicey, but it does work. And a lot of people get it to work, and a lot of people do not get it to work. But again, I'm not I'm not the owner of Q Image. And again, I don't care about that. I just print a 13 by 19 with a nice big wide border. And so I don't have a problem with those wide imposed borders. They actually do help, especially when working on very, very thick texture papers. The Artisan 1430 art is already four years old using continuous ink system. And the results are amazing on gloss and my gloss. And Matt, hard to find better printer for that size. Well, that's the same as the 1400, which I still have, and I actually love it. There you go. So those are the uh, six colors on the new Epson printers. Gloss differential, yes. That's what the uh, pigment Epson printers have. If they don't give you a gloss enhancer, you're going to end up with some gloss differential problems you know, in, in certain conditions, certain types of media. Is there an update? Whoops. Is there an update about the Canon Pro 1000 chip reset? No, that don't work. That's the update. My Pro 1000 right now has about four or five colors, real colors, that are about to go empty. Hopefully, once I get my printer, my, my computer alive again, I'll be able to uh, continue printing on it and, and get them down to nothing and see if they reset. But I don't think they will. The previous four that I had to replace the chips for did not. Okay. So if that's any any indication, that's, you know, that's not something that I look forward to happening. Unfortunately. Now, there is a rumor that there are some Chinese chips that supposedly work, but again, at twenty dollars each, I am not about to try them. Rick has two sets now, but more are coming. Yeah, sets of cartridges. That is, any news about a chip resetter for the P nine thousand? No, there's really nothing for any of the P anything uh, printers. If you if you mean nine hundred. I think that's what you mean, because the P9000 is a humongous printer. Um, if that's what you mean, then no, there's nothing. There's not going to be anything available. Just like for the P800, there's just, at this point, we have to rely on other ways to get around that. A nine-year-old Epson R2000 and is still working great. I know you've mentioned that you own one too. I was wondering if you have any knowledge of its life expectancy. I really don't know. Uh, it's, it's really very simple. The life expectancy is basically when it dies. That's it. I, I You know, there are people that get very few prints on a printer and it dies, and people that can get 17,000 prints done. My, P, my Pro 3800 has 17,000 prints on it, and it still works. And I had a... Another 3,800 with about 500 prints, and it died, completely dead. Nothing happens. It prints, but nothing happens. And it's not because it's clogged. It's like the print head no longer receives the code to print.
Hi, Jose. Is it possible to print on higher than 350 grams per meter paper square meter uh, on a Pro 10? I have some paper samples. I want to know if it is worth trying them. The only way to know is to try. You may have to use the rear manual feeder. That's all. And that's basically a very shallow band. So you don't have to, the paper does not have to stress so much trying to make the much more acute bend that the top or what they call the rear feeder has to uh, put the paper through. Just try it and see. What do they recommend? I mean, what do the, the paper manufacturer recommend and follow those uh, recommendations? Pro 21, Pro 2100 is the new Pro 2000 replacement. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, is it better? Well, it has some features that are rather interesting. I know I know about the Pro 4100, and I assume that both of the printers with the extra 100 added have the same features. The rolls will have uh, some sort of barcoding system, and so when you load it, it will know what kind of paper it is, and it will set itself to the correct settings. Yeah. And with the dual roll adapter, it's just a matter of removing one and loading the other one. There's none of this multiple loading attempts. No, it does everything for you. Um, what else does it do? I can't remember what else it did. But that was basically the biggest things about them. Yeah, I saw that. Did you ask that twice? Maybe not. Yes, it is. 2100 is the Pro One 2000 replacement. Jose, the vinyl you printed on using the P100, is it stretchable? No, it is not. It's, it's just it's just like, like a window shade. The kind you pull down, that's the consistency of it. I have it downstairs. I was going to show you guys, but, you know, the thing with my computer happened today, and I, I have been doing other things trying to revive it. Um, what would you use it for? Oh, that's a good question. I still haven't come up with one um, use for it, but it is interesting. And I only have about maybe eight feet left anyway. You know, you use it for, you can use it for something like a hanging um, sign. Yeah. You would leave um, a border above and a border below run it over a strip of wood and stitch it. Yeah, that would be, you know, that, that would be perfect for that. Do you have any thoughts on why Wilhelm Research has never tested Canon dye base ink? Because they probably don't have much interest in doing that, really, to tell you the truth. They probably don't care. You're thinking about you think you're thinking Epson R2000, and she's talking Canon Pro. To, oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. You know, hey, what can I say? So instead of the 2100, which one do you recommend for the 24 wide? Um, why not the 2100? Um, maybe one of the Epson, the the. Let's see, does the P5000 do 24 inch or is it still 17 inch? One of those, uh, either one, either one. The, there's nothing wrong with the 2000 or the 2100 uh, when it comes to uh, 24 inch capacity. They're both excellent. Yeah, so if that's what you mean, then yeah, if you want the 2100, it's just an upgraded. 2000. It's not old. It's, it's brand new. Yeah, well, I thought we were talking about the old Epson because before the Stylus Photo 2200, there was a Stylus Photo 2100. And the Stylus Photo 2000 is even older than that. Yeah. So you got to get the, the, the initial two letters right. So... 
Full name is Image Canon Image Prograph Pro 2100. I think we need a chat ASAP to try to get your PC working again. You want to hang out afterwards? Are you able to uh, do a video um, share like I'm doing here? I can I can sign off and and um, I can, I'll give you the link right now, and then you can uh, stay on, don't leave, and then you take that link and you uh, click on it, and you can enter. And uh, I'll have you here in front of me, if like you were next with me. There is the link. It's at the bottom of the chat right now. Again, if you're able to do that, fine. If not, then we can still chat, um, even with just a microphone. So why Mr. Jose said that it's difficult to find ink for the camera? Yeah, because I thought you were talking about the Epson stylus photo, because people have been talking about the 2200. And when I heard the 2100 mentioned, that's what it, it brought to my mind. So that's why. So no, there is no problem finding ink. It uses the same exact ink as the Pro 2000 uses. Anyway, remember the Pro 2000 and the 4000 and the 6000 uses the same cartridges. And so will the 2100, the 4100. And if they make a 6100, it will use the same inks as well. I see you. I see you, uh, Chris. Uh, let me let me let me have you wait a little while. I'm going to go ahead and uh, sign off, and you will still stay there. So let me just finish up real quick here. Got a couple more questions here. Anyone notice that Epson P700 and P900 roll adapters show 10 long rolls or support 10 foot long rolls are supported? I use up to 100 foot rolls on my P800. Yeah, um, I don't know what that's about. I really don't know what that's about. Yeah, that's the P5000 is only 17 inches. That's what I thought. It replaced the 4900. P8000, however, is 24. Good. Thank you for that info. Yep. And yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And I'm going to hang out with uh, our PC technician here. And maybe he can help me out. So we'll see what it is. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see you. There'll be no music. There'll be no farewell sign because again that lives in the other computer so bye bye everybody it'll just be me hopefully next week um back in the same room you always see me in with my computer my wife told me buy a new computer i said no that's a damn good computer it's, it's pretty pretty decked out as far as specs go so no i'm not going to spend the money on a new computer just to get me going this is fine for broadcasting here this used to be my older computer that I hand me down on to her so that she can have something reliable. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Have a great week, folks, and continue printing. Bye-bye, everyone.